uh, dozens of northern newspaper editorials in 1860 and early 1861 who said just that, that, that it just makes a mockery of the idea of a, of a genuine union of states if some of them are held as subject provinces at the barrel of a gun. It's, it's no union, you've destroyed the union. So he saved the union geographically, but he destroyed it philosophically, which is what counts uh, in my view. He saved the Constitution. You read this everywhere. He saved the Constitution. Uh, I argue in the book that he did uh, permanent and irreparable damage to the Constitution. And another thing I point out in the book is that left-wing scholars are now admitting this. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, in the early days, 50 or 60 years ago, uh, historians like James Randall uh, would make excuses. They would look at how Lincoln trashed the constitutional liberty during the war and they would make excuses for it. Uh, he, had, he was forced into it. Uh, uh, the, uh, the suspension of habeas corpus didn't last forever. Uh, on and on and on, excuse after excuse. But now there are historians such as Gary Wills, or he's not a historian, he's a journalist, and uh, George P. Fletcher, who's a law professor at uh, Columbia, who are now saying, well, yes, Lincoln did all these things, but it's a good thing that he did because otherwise we would may never have been able to adopt egalitarianism in America. That is, we, uh, the subtitle, uh, or the title of Fletcher's book is Our Secret Constitution. And he makes the argument that thanks to Lincoln, we subverted and essentially destroyed the real Constitution, and in its place through hundreds of legal precedents have created uh, de facto a new constitution that replaces individual liberty as the, as the purpose of government in its place, says Fletcher, egalitarianism, nationalism, and democracy. Uh, socialism, in other words, that's a pretty good definition of socialism. So the, the leftist historians are now, they're not even trying to make excuses for Lincoln's trashing of the, con of the constitution. They're saying the ends justify the means now. Um, and let me give you some examples of what I mean by this uh, trashing the Constitution. Um, <clears throat> and some of you who have read some of my articles and things are familiar with this. He invaded the southern states without consulting Congress. That's unconstitutional. Declared martial law. That's unconstitutional. Blockaded southern ports without, su without declaring war. That's unconstitutional. Suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, everybody at the time said only Congress could do that legally. He imprisoned without trial some 13 northern citizens, arrested and imprisoned newspaper publishers who were critical of him, censored all telegraph communications, nationalized the railroads, created uh, uh, three new states, Kansas, Nevada, and West Virginia, without the consent of the citizens of those states in order to rig the 1864 elections and give himself more, more uh, electoral votes. Uh, he uh, had soldiers interfere with elections in the North. Uh, they used colored ballots, like a blue ballot was Republican, a red ballot was a de Democrat. And if you saw someone with the wrong color, the soldiers would not let them vote in city after city. Uh, even David Donald, who's a, a, a re probably the preeminent Lincoln scholar of the day uh, from Harvard, said, that, uh, I quote him as saying, uh, with the help of federal bayonets, Lincoln won New York State by 7,000 votes in 1864. So this is not a secret. This is not something that I've dug up. This has been well known for a long time that they literally used bayonets, soldiers with bayonets, to rig the northern elections. Um, and uh, Clinton Rossiter, who was a, a very uh, worshipful historian of Lincoln, said this about, about all this. He said, this amazing disregard for the Constitution was considered by nobody as legal, end quote. And that was what Clinton Rossiter. And the most outrageous thing here was uh, Clement Vallandigham of Ohio, a congressman from Ohio, who was uh, the, the big thorn in Lincoln's side. Uh, uh, he had him deported. He had deported and he ended up in, in Canada. And uh, why did he have him uh, deported? Well, uh, Valand reading some of Vallandigham's speeches is, uh, to me, was thrilling. Is, is like reading Thomas Jefferson's political speeches. He, he was, he was a, a real Jeffersonian, a real classical liberal, and I recommend uh, uh, Clement Vallandigham <coughs> to, to anybody. But just some of the things uh, he said, the, the thing that I think was the straw that broke the camel's back with Lincoln uh, was, was this thing that Vallandigham said. Yeah, let's see if he's this. This was a speech on the floor of the House of Representatives where he was criticized, all these 
obstructions of the Constitution that I just mentioned. Vallandigham was criticizing Lincoln for this. He wasn't saying, he, I'm a secessionist. He wasn't saying uh, uh, anything of the sort. He was saying, if you want to arrest somebody for treason, do it through the civil law process. Don't have federal soldiers without a warrant break somebody's front door down like they did to Vallandigham. They broke his door down in Dayton, Ohio in the middle of the night, dragged him off to military prison. With no warrants, no, never arrested for anything. And that's, that happened to 13,000 people. Uh, here's what Vallandigham said. He complained about the quartering of soldiers in private homes uh, without the consent of the owner. This is in the North. And without any manner having been prescribed by law to the sub subversion in part at least of Maryland, of her own state government and of the authorities under it, to the censorship of the telegraph, the infringement repeatedly in one or more of the states of the right of the people to keep and bear arms. They went around taking uh, arms away from people. For their defense, uh, for, for free speech too, has been repeatedly denied. And then here's, here's the thing, in my opinion, I make this case in the book, the thing that really got Belandigam in trouble, where he really let the cat out of the bag, where he, he described the real Lincoln on the floor of the House of Representatives. And in my opinion, Lincoln could not tolerate this. He, he took the mask off. He unmasked them. He said, uh, he said, the real purpose of these acts, Belanium said, was national banks, bankrupt laws, a vast and permanent public debt, high tariffs, heavy direct ta taxation, enormous expenditure, gigantic and stupendous peculation. I'm not sure what peculation is. I should have read that. And strong government, no more state lines, no more state governments, and a consolidated monarchy or vast centralized military despotism, end quote. That's what Vallandigan was quoting Lincoln of, of, uh, of doing. Of course, he did every one of these things. Nothing here was false. Every single one of these things happened. And he, so he was deported uh, uh, after that. Um, okay. Um, uh, Harry Jaffa, another fantasy Lincoln thing I'll mention is Harry Jaffa wrote an article about Lincoln's culture of life, he called it, culture of life. Uh, I write about Lincoln's culture of death in the book. Uh, some 50,000 Southern civilians were killed by the Federal Army. One out of four Southern white men between 20 and 40 years of age were killed. Randolph Jackson and Meridian, Mississippi were burned to the ground, as was Atlanta. Uh, when Atlanta was burned, 90% of the structures were burned to the ground. And then after they were all burned out, uh, winter was coming on, uh, Sherman ordered the remaining residents to, to evict them from their homes. Just imagine if Stonewall Jackson had burned Philadelphia to a smoldering ruin and there were 2,000 people left and it was February in Pennsylvania and he evicted them from their homes and the countryside had no food in it. That's what Sherman did. Uh, historians would still be writing this as the, one of the great war crimes in all of history, but it's, you know, it's a glorious achievement uh, now. Uh, Honest Abe, that's the fantasy Lincoln. My Lincoln, the real Lincoln, is a spectacular liar. Uh, you know, one, of the, one of the interpretations I give of, of secession, the whole issue of secession, was no one really questioned the right of secession for, uh, until about the 1840s, the 1830s actually, when uh, Daniel Webster, the, uh, the leader of the Whig Party, which was Lincoln's party, decided to rewrite history. And I mentioned in the book, it, says, it reminds me of how the communists rewrote his, their history to gain power. And the history that Daniel Webster rewrote was that the federal government created the states. And that is just totally backwards. This, this, it's very clear. I, I can't see how anybody could make that argument. But it was the states in, in their political conventions that created the federal government as their agent. No one questioned this uh, at all. But Webster came up with this theory and Lincoln latched onto it. And that turned into Lincoln's rationale for the war and for why he, he argued uh, as a trial lawyer that the states had no right to secede because uh, the federal government in his view was not the creature of the states. Even though several states uh, as a condition of ratifying the Constitution explicitly reserved the right to uh, withdraw at any time they thought their rights were being violated uh, Virginia, New York, and uh, Rhode Island did that. It's very clear that they, that they did that. Uh, you can look up uh, uh, Tocqueville very clearly said this when he was commenting on uh, the issue of states' rights. Uh, so did Alexander Hamilton, for that matter, the big centralizer. Uh, 
But Lincoln, uh, I, I borrow the phrase from Don Livingston that this was Lincoln's spectacular lie. It was not just a lie, but it was a spectacular lie. It was breathtaking uh, in its audacity, but that's the lie that was told. Um, Lincoln is called the great reconciliator. He used beautiful language about binding the nation's wounds during Reconstruction. You've all heard that, binding the nation's wounds. I argue that the party of Lincoln poured salt into the nation's wounds for 12 more years after the war was over because of what they did during Reconstruction where they disenfranchised uh, uh, white males and enfranchised all the ex-slaves as quickly as they could and uh, voted in tax increase after tax increase after tax increase and heavy debt in the southern states for railroad building again, uh, things like that. And, uh, and very little came of it in terms of public benefit in the, in the southern states. So I have a chapter on Reconstruction too. And, uh, and so this is, uh, you know, this book might be a little bit controversial. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm just <laughs> guessing. Uh, that it, it already has been. Uh, it already has been. And so uh, uh, I hope you get an idea of how I, I uh, came as an economist to this because I thought mercantilism essentially uh, was what Lincoln was all about. There was always a group of men in America who wanted mercantilism. Uh, Lincoln, in my view, was the political son of Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton uh, fought for a highly centralized government, but for what? Central planning of the economy, high taxes, high public debt, corporate welfare. That's what. That's what it's for. You needed a centralized government for that. And the, the, uh, the Whigs battled for this for decades and never had any success until Lincoln came along and they achieved, they ended the debate in 1861 and won the debate by force of arms. Uh, they got their way uh, by force and coercion rather than argumentation. And uh, the final thing I'll say, my time is about up, is some of the great classical liberals or libertarians of the day understood the, the real meaning of what happened here, what was happening. And some of you, many of you have probably read this, uh, even I've quoted it in a few places. But Lord Acton, the great historian of liberty, uh, had a correspondence with Robert E. Lee. Uh, and in uh, November 4th, 1866, he wrote to General Lee and said this, I saw in states' rights the only availing check upon the absolutism of the sovereign will and secession filled me with hope, not as a destruction, but as a redemption of democracy. The institutions of your republic um, have not exercised on the old world the salutary and liberating influence which ought to have belonged to them by reason of those defects and abuses of principle which the Confederate Constitution was expressly and wisely calculated to remedy. I believe that the example of that great reform, the Confederate Constitution, would have blessed all the races of mankind by establishing true freedom purged of the native dangers and disorders of the republics. Therefore, I deem that you were fighting the battles of our liberty, our progress, and our civilization, and I mourn for the stake which was lost at Richmond more deeply than I rejoice over that which was saved at Waterloo." Uh, end quote. And that was uh, the great Lord Acton uh, commenting there. And so, uh, just the opposite of the story you hear nowadays, that Lincoln saved uh, uh, government for the people, by the people, of the people, and all that, he destroyed that. And I make the argument in the last chapter that this was a turning point in, in American history where the American citizens went from being the, uh, the masters to being the servants of government at this point. And finally, uh, Lysander Spooner, the great libertarian legal scholar and philosopher, uh, who uh, in the 1840s, he was a prominent abolitionist in New England. He was from Massachusetts. And uh, his whole family had been abolitionists. He had written a defense uh, or an attack on the fugitive slave law. He wrote a book on jury nullification as a handbook for lawyers in the northern states to use whenever a runaway slave was brought before trial to be used to make the argument to give the slave his freedom. And so Lysander Spooner was a famous abolitionist and he was a brilliant legal scholar. But five years after the war was over, in fact, the, the Massachusetts bar gave him uh, the highest awards it could give anyone because of his writings on legal strategy to deal with runaway slaves. Uh, but five years after the war was over, this is what Spooner wrote. He said, all of these cries of having abolished slavery, of having saved the country, of having preserved the union, of establishing a government of consent, uh, 
and of maintaining the national honor are all gross, shameless, transparent cheats, so transparent that they ought to deceive no one, end quote. Now, but of course, the victors always write the history. So that's why for 135 years now, Americans have been taught about the fantasy Lincoln. And, but now I'm gonna set everyone straight with my book on the, on the real Lincoln. And, uh, and it's available for sale wherever books are sold next week or on amazon.com on the computer downstairs uh, uh, today. And then my time is up. <laughs> Laissez-faire books, uh, it's on the cover of the Laissez-faire book catalog this month. And uh, they didn't give me a centerfold. I asked for a centerfold, but it's on the, it's on the cover of uh, Laissez-faire books. Yeah, you can buy it from them. Uh, but uh, well, that's time is up. It's called tomorrow, actually, and we're going to talk about that. So they're, they're working on trying to, I've done some radio interviews so far, but uh, I'm going to hope to do that. Uh, I was telling uh, Hans at lunch that I was on the Bill O'Reilly show a couple years ago uh, for my book, The Food and Drink Police. So I'm hoping to get on there again because he's, uh, he's sort of a big dunce, but uh, he has a big audience. <laughs> he has a big audience, and he might, uh, uh, he might, uh, so I'm, uh, hopefully, I don't know, uh, sure. Uh, I think the, the lady here had her hand up. Okay. Oh, uh, the New York the New York City media was bludgeoned by the Lincoln administration. The the mayor of New York, Fernando Wood, proposed having New York City secede from the state of New York and the United States. He wanted it to be what he called a free city because they were free traders. They they, they relied on inter international commerce and they did a lot of trade with the South. And so there was a very strong pro secession movement in New York City, especially and the, the Journal of Commerce and, and a number of other papers in New York City were very skeptical of Lincoln. And so Lincoln literally had his army uh, go in there and arrest the editors and the owners and put them in prison in Fort Lafayette in New York Harbor. And there were federal troops that went around destroying the printing presses. They literally destroyed the printing presses. Other places in the country, they denied them the use of the mails because in those days, newspapers were all delivered by mail and so almost all. And so there was one newspaper owner in particular who was critical like Vallandigam was, uh, uh, not urging uh, secession or anything like that, but urging let's negotiate peace. So let's, let's try to negotiate peace or let's not have the income tax or you know, let's not have military conscription. Let's debate this. Uh, they denied them the use of the mails. The one newspaper owner then hired private couriers, which I think was probably the first paper boys ever in America but at that point, Lincoln sent the army in and shut them down altogether because they, you know, they got around his, his regulation. And so there were dozens, probably hundreds of newspapers that literally the owners and editors were put into prison with, uh, and the writ of habeas corpus had been uh, suspended by Lincoln unilaterally without Congress. Congress eventually got around to rubber stamping it. And so there was no warrant. No one ever uh, arrested them or charged them with anything. They just put them in prison for a while. And that, of course, sent the message to every other newspaper in America that you don't criticize Abraham Lincoln uh, for fear of being thrown in prison. Uh, and so I, I think that had that, that effect. And so uh, Bill O'Reilly, uh, uh, he would have been a stooge like the rest of them were in the Northern press, I think. Uh, either that or he would have been in prison. So if I go on a show, I'll ask him that question. I'll, I'll, I'll give him these facts. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Is your perception that uh, the South would have been better off had Lincoln survived or would have been dead? Um, well, that, that's tough to say. And most people will say, well, of course, if, if he'd have survived, uh, you know, there wouldn't have been as much revenge. But uh, Lincoln was a consummate politician his, his whole political life. Uh, Murray Rothbard once said, uh, to call him you know, a consummate politician means he was a, a consummate liar, conniver, and manipulator. That's what he was. And uh, uh, what happened after his assassination when the, during so-called Reconstruction was the Republican Party had a monopoly for 30 years, essentially. Uh, you know, they essentially controlled things until Franklin Roosevelt was elected, really, uh, in terms of policy. But for the next 20 or 30 years, I quote uh, the historian Richard Benzel as saying uh, 
The only other uh, example he can think of any political party that had that kind of power were the Bolsheviks in Russia. You know, as far as you know, un just pure monopoly power in politics. And Lincoln being such a consummate politician, I think he would have gleefully exercised that power. He, he once said, I quote him in my book as saying, his plan for uh, governing the South after the war was to have a 10% minority who were faithful to the Union to govern the rest. That was his idea of democracy. So all the talk about Lincoln saving democracy and the, the consent of the governed, he explicitly said, uh, he, if we can find 10% of Southerners who are loyal to me, to the, to the gover federal government, we'll, put them in, we'll make them all the governors and the senators and the congressmen and the state legislators, and we'll have them rule the other 90%. That was Lincoln's definition of democracy, his own words. And so it may well have been worse. I don't know. Uh, but it was bad enough there was a lot of revenge that was, uh, that was gotten after his death. But uh, it might have been uh, even worse had he still been in charge, I think. Because I, I don't believe the business about uh, how he was such a gentle soul and wanted to reconcile the country after. Uh, one, one thing I'll mention, the, one of the things that uh, is really spooky uh, about reading Lincoln's speeches is if you connect these things, Frank Talsig, the great historian of tariff history, said that in 1857, the average tariff rate in America was 15%, one five, what Talsig says. Uh, it's tricky to compute average tariff rates sometimes, but that's what he said. He said it was the, the, uh, the lowest tariff rate of anywhere in the 19th century. The Republicans come in, and they propose making the, uh, the average tariff rate 47%, pretty much tripling the tariff rate. At the time, Southerners were paying about 80% of all tariff revenues. So they're already paying 80%, and here comes Lincoln and the Republicans saying, we're gonna triple the rate that you're paying. And then, in his first inaugural address, he says, in his first inaugural address, I don't wanna look for it, take too much time, but he, that my, one of my duties is to collect the tariff revenues, and save for that, there will be no invasion of any state. That's a lawyer's way of saying, if you don't collect this triple tax rate, I'm going to invade. That's what he said in the first inaugural. So what were the Southerners to think? They're, they're already being plundered, paying 80% of all federal taxes. The Republicans are in. It's a sectional party only from the North. We're going we're gonna to triple the uh, amount of plunder. And then they have Lincoln there saying, and if you don't pay, we're going to shoot. Uh, the South Carolinians in 1828 nullified the tariff of abominations and they succeeded. Lincoln wasn't gonna let it happen again. He threatened a, an invasion. Uh, uh, yes, sir, in the back, we have, uh, you had your hand. Uh, do you think Edgar Lee Hatch is a good biography of Lincoln? Do you have a pretty accurate assessment? I think it's a great biography. Uh, one measure of how great it is, is I looked through a lot of Lincoln, the Lincoln literature for references to it. And wherever I did find a reference to it, I would find a distinguished historian saying, well, there's this guy, Edgar Lee Masters, who wrote this book uh, on Lincoln, but it's not a serious book and you shouldn't read it. And so, uh, to me, that's, no, a, that's a sign that it's it a great book. It's, uh, uh, yeah. it's oh, yes, I, I, know, I know it has yeah. been reprinted by, the, uh, yeah, by your foundation, I think. Yeah, I own a copy. Um, well, let me, let me quote Edgar Lee Masters. I would recommend the book, the Edgar Lee Masters, to anybody. Oh, yes. He yeah. wrote the good introduction to the biography. He mentions the, uh, he mentions when, uh, uh, Masters writing the biography of Masters. He doesn't mention the Powell Lincoln, and he doesn't mention the fact that he wrote the good introduction and felt it should come to him. You know, it's, a, yeah. it's an earned book. Yeah. That's what you find. That's, that's what I found everywhere. Even uh, there's the editor of Ebony Magazine. Uh, a black man, of course, uh, wrote a book called Forced Into Glory, Abraham Lincoln's White Dream, where he's really incensed over Lincoln and colonization. And he found out that Lincoln wanted to ship every last black person out of the country. And he wrote, this book is very well researched. And I've looked around also at the mainstream historians. What have they said about Lerone Bennett Jr., the, the man's name? No, it's, oh, a it's, it's a non-book. Even, even Gabor Borat has a whole chapter on colonization in his latest book. And 
he does not cite Lerone Bennett Jr., even though he smears Lerone Bennett Jr. in the text, but he does not footnote it so that you can tell the title of his book. But that's how they operate. But on, on Edgar Lee Masters, he was uh, Clarence Darrow's law partner. He was the author of the Spoon River Anthology, a famous playwright. St I think it's still playing on Broadway, Spoon River yeah, Anthology. He does. It's a new but but he, uh, he, he understood Lincoln very well, and, uh, and he gave me a lot of clues. You know, my, one of my themes is Lincoln was a mercantilist. That's what, that's what motivated him. He wanted to be the DeWitt Clinton of yeah, Illinois. I and, uh, well, yes, I remember reading that too. Yeah. But, but uh, uh, Masters, uh, Lincoln div uh, said over and over and over again, Henry Clay was his role model. He said over and over and over again, that's Henry Clay. And here's uh, in, in w one minute. Okay, this will be the last thing I'll say, and then we'll take a, a break. But uh, maybe my watch stopped. I don't know. No, it's still going. Um, I wear a Swiss Army watch because there's no such thing as a Swiss Army, by the way. You know, they don't have an army in, Swiss Ar in Switzerland. Everyone's required to own a machine gun, but there's no army. Uh, uh, it's what Edgar Lee Masters said about Henry Clay, who Lincoln was his idol. He said, Henry Clay was a champion of that political system which doles favors to the strong in order to win and to keep their adherence to the government. His system offered shelter to devious schemes and corrupt enterprises. He was the beloved son of Alexander Hamilton, figuratively speaking, with his corrupt funding schemes, his superstitions concerning the advantage of a public debt, and a people taxed to make profits for enterprises that cannot stand alone. His example and his doctrines led to the creation of a party, the Whig Party, that had no platform to announce because its principles were plunder and nothing else." End quote. And that could have been said about Abraham Lincoln as well. And uh, that's all we have time for, I guess. Um, uh,